Conspiracies happen. Sometimes there really are people who are plotting. Sometimes people use their power to undermine the power of others and harm people for their own personal gain. Sometimes your paranoia is justified. Perhaps then we should all be a little more suspicious. After all, don't we want to protect the freedoms of our families, friends, and neighbors? Perhaps, but perhaps not. What if our suspicions lead us down a never-ending rabbit hole? What if our quest for seeing things as they really are only erodes our ability to see the truth? What if our convictions and suspicions actually make it easier for truly dangerous people to remain hidden from our view? What do you mean? That's exactly what they want you to think. Who are they? Ah. I see. Hello and welcome to episode 95 of the Pansai Cast. I'm the hound dog that is Mr. Jack Symes and I'm joined once again by the suspicious mind that is Mr. Ollie Marley. Hello. And the man who can't help falling in love, Mr. Andrew Horton. Hello. August 16th, 1977. Does that mean anything to you? The date that Elvis died, isn't it? You'll believe anything that big media tell you, Andrew. (laughs) (laughs) God. Welcome to our Conspiracy Theories mini-series. We're still under lockdown here in the UK, so we're recording over the dark web in our tinfoil hats. We hope you've been enjoying our interviews lately, but we couldn't wait any longer to give you an old school special. We do need to begin with some sad news. Over the last two years, the show has been supported by Cullum St. Gabriel's and West Hill Endowment. We're incredibly grateful to both West Hill and Cullum's for their support and generosity. And we know that you, wonderful listener, are grateful to them too. As you've probably guessed from my description, sad news, Cullum's and West Hill have not been able to extend our funding beyond that two year period. There's loads of costs that go into producing the show. From editing, to equipment, to the books for research and hosting fees. And at present, we have a team of eight people working on the Pan Psycast. Let me emphasize, none of us are getting paid for our work on the show. Everything you give us will go right back into the content we make for you. Why are we telling you this? Well, we need your support. We're setting a goal. By episode 100, we need to reach 200 patrons. (gasps) At the moment, we've got 113, so we're asking you... Yes, you, Liam, Mohammed, Olivia, Ahmed, Emma, James, William, Mary, Sky, Fatima. No, I didn't just Google most common names. I'm talking to you. Go and support the show. Hit the link in the iTunes description, patreon.com forward slash pansycast. As you know, a series on conspiracy theories could cost you £4, £5 online. We're going to give it you for free. We've spent a good uh, couple of weeks doing all of our research, reading loads of books for you to give you an awesome series today. So please do the right thing. Even if it's a pound, it might be just a dollar, whatever it is, it all adds up. 200 patrons by episode 100. Help us keep the show on the air. A bit of knowing me, knowing Andrew. Knowing me, knowing Andrew. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. There is nothing he can do. Knowing me, knowing Andrew. Andrew. Andrew, why are we doing conspiracy theories and what inspired you to pick the topic? Well, I think like a lot of people, it's just inherently interesting. I love reading and watching things about conspiracies. And there's always that suspicious element to it that gets you hooked and you want to know more. And even if you reject it outright is when we get into analysis, like why these things are actually a bit of a problem is that people want to engage with them no matter how we feel about them. And what actually inspired my particular interest in this is I was looking around for stuff for a particular episode because this is one of our ones where we put it up to vote for Patreons. And when I looked around, I came across Kasim Kassam's little book on conspiracy theories. And it's a very short read, but it's packed full of really great little details and his own analysis on what conspiracy theories are all about. That led me to read one of his other books, Vices of the Mind as well. And I really enjoyed that too. And so I started putting notes together and I thought, yeah, this would make a really good talking point and then recommend it to you guys. And then it got picked and I'm glad that we're doing it now. Very grateful to our listeners on Patreon for picking it. We put up a topic each and Andrew won. A little bit suspicious, if you ask me, Andrew, you won by a landslide. 
Uh, rigged election, if you uh, if don't mind me posing a conspiracy from the off. It's my connections with the reptilians, Jack. <laughs> the reptilians. I think it is also worth saying that any long-term listeners will be aware that we love a conspiracy here at the Pan Sidecast, whether it's St. Thomas Aquinas up a tower filled with prostitutes or whether it's Descartes <laughs> having a sword fight on a ship. We always bring them up. So it's lovely to actually get the opportunity. It's the, the Descartes assassination thing as well. <laughs> yeah, no, Descartes did, did actually have a fight on a ship with a sword and he won. That was true. He wrote that. That wasn't a conspiracy. No, I don't know. Maybe I don't a story just made don't up. I cool. about that, Jack. Your idea that Descartes didn't do that is the conspiracy, yeah. Ollie. People like AC Grayling and Alex Jones like to spin a conspiracy theory about <laughs> René Descartes whenever they can. Uh, spy poisoned. We love talking about them. So it's been a wonderful opportunity to dive into conspiracy theories in depth and bring all of our research together for you, our dear listeners. You're going to get all of the benefits of hours and hours of research into the philosophy of conspiracy theories. Do you enjoy your research, Ollie? I did very much so. Yeah. It's a very grim time at the moment in the world, isn't it? So it was lovely to get to read about the weird and wonderful psychology behind conspiracy theories, the history behind them. I thought, for example, they were a really recent thing, but turns out not at all. They've been around pretty much as long as there's been people thinking. So yeah, it's been wonderful to research it and I can't wait to get to share it with you guys and talk about it, discuss it and come to our conclusion that yes, we are being run by lizards and we should now bow down to our lizard overlords. I hear that. Why wait any longer? Let's jump into part one. Part one, origins. So in this week's instalment, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what the key features and concepts surrounding conspiracy theories are, and then we're going to discuss why people actually believe them and how many people essentially believe them. It's next week where we're going to engage in the philosophy and analysis of what kind of philosophical mistakes they make and how we can tackle them. So let's kick off then with what a conspiracy is. In simple terms, Kassam defines it in his book as a conspiracy requires a small group of conspirators who work together in secret to do something illegal or harmful. And I think particularly the idea that most conspiracies are assumed to be harmful is important. You could envision a conspiracy of people planning to do some good in secret, but that's not usually what people are thinking about when they're talking about conspiring at all. Yeah, and conspiracism appears to be a very natural psychological view. So Rob Brotherton says that actually there's part of our psychology which is quite conspiratory, not necessarily connected to conspiracy theories, but the idea that as human beings we like to connect things up, make connections between different pieces of evidence and ask questions. And if you've ever spent any time with children or young people, you know that we like to ask a lot of questions. And that's kind of the root mud of where conspiracy theories grow. Cool. So we're saying like a conspiracy is something that's secret, involves two or more people, and it's usually harmful or illegal. It's very rare that conspiracies involve some kind of benevolent force that's trying to make the world better. And the first thing we should say is what we might call actual conspiracies, including the title, actually occur. It's like Julius Caesar being assassinated, Guy Fawkes, Franz Ferdinand, the Iraq war, US government spying with the NSA, VW cheating the carbon tests. People do actually carry them out. But when we're typically thinking about conspiracy theories, we don't normally mean actual conspiracies, right? We typically think of something separate. Yeah, so Kassam in his book uses the term conspiracy theories with a capital C and a capital T. And he says these are very, very different to what we would consider just basic conspiracies. And I think there's a nice reference here we can make to two sociologists. So Seymour Lipset and Earl Raab say that a successful conspiracy theory needs just two elements. A mysterious cabal, which is thought to be pulling the (laughs) strings behind the scenes, but also a less mysterious, more visible target group associated with that cabal. And Mm. they say if it doesn't have that two things, then that conspiracy theory doesn't stick. So in your head now, if you think of popular conspiracy theories that you may have heard about, so let's take, for example, the assassination of JFK, you can have the obvious example, which is he was assassinated by Lee Harvey Oswald. That's the surface level idea. But then deeper behind that, there may be a conspiracy theory, capital C, capital T, that actually there was maybe some other nefarious goings on. Maybe he was part of a larger group. Maybe it was the Russians. Maybe it was the mafia. Maybe it was the government itself. So that's one way you can start to look at these conspiracy theories. There's the surface level explanation, but then there's a deeper level that's hidden away. 
So there's those key features, aren't there, that a lot of these, all the books which I was picking up on conspiracy theories pointed to something similar. Normally the first thing they say is, the, let's take the JFK case, for example. In the first instance, the official story, like from the, uh, the American government, let's say, and all the reports they filed, and they spent millions, didn't they, on, on researching what actually happened. Yeah, we're going to get into this more in part three. We're going to love talking about the JFK. There's two major investigations, and still I think it's eight out of ten Americans believe that they're both completely false. <laughs> <laughs> so a, a conspiracy theory with a capital C and a capital T or conspiracy theories, Ooh. they say that it's not how it appears to be. So it's either not right according to the official view. So it's contrary to the official view. But sometimes like the American government will tell you that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. So that's the official view. So it, that can't be the definition. So sometimes it might actually be that it's contrary to the obvious explanation of things, how things look and seem. Things look or seem or are told to be a certain way, and a conspiracy theory is contrary to that. So that means often they're speculative as well. They're based on conjecture rather than actual knowledge. So the challenge there or where that comes from is that if it's not going to be the official view or known by everybody, then essentially it is going to be speculative, right? Because if it wasn't speculative, if it didn't make, let's just say from the get-go, strong inductive leaps from the breadcrumbs or loose change or small bits of evidence they have, then everyone would think it was true, right? But the conspiracy theorist connects the dot or it follows the breadcrumbs to the breadcrumb house and not everybody wants to go there. We, we've all read the story. With that though, that's part of the appeal, isn't it? Because it is this contrarian thing, which is outside of the mainstream analysis of what actually happened in an event. And because it's speculative, it creates this mystery for people to solve. And Kassam points out that these conspiracy theories often are very esoteric. They require this really special type of expertise that people begin to develop and analyze these things that almost appear very academic and even says that another key feature of these theories are their amateurishness. So one key thing that a lot of conspiracy theorists will do is they will pile their theories of loads of footnotes to create what appears to be a really robust set of data. Wow, this person's done a lot of the groundwork here. This must be really true. Of course, if you were to follow all those links, you might find that they also lead to another series of problems. And yet, it still appeals to a certain group of people where it looks very concrete. Sounds like my thesis. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I want to build on what Andy's saying there. I think this is quite interesting because currently, you know, we're recording this in our lovely year 2021. And lots of media pundits have said that we're in the era of post-truth, right? Where you can have your truth, one interpretation of events, and I can have my truth, which is my interpretation of events. And famously in the UK, we've had politicians, people like Michael Gove, go on the TV and say, we've had enough of experts. We don't want the experts, the people that have spent years of their life researching certain things. We can make those decisions for ourselves. And that really builds on Andy's idea there of this being very amateurish, that actually, no, my intuition or my thoughts on this are equal or the same as someone who studied this certain thing for years and years and years, right? So let's take, I don't know, the example of like a 9-11 truther, right? So someone who believes that 9-11 was planned and instigated by the US government. They may not be an engineer, they may not be an expert in architecture, they may not know anything about jet planes, but their intuition that 9-11 was an inside job that involved covering up that from thousands of people is more realistic than 12 hijackers seems to them to be true. And that's the definition of this amateurishness, right? It's people going on their intuitions, like Jack said earlier, connecting the dots up, following the breadcrumbs to the did you say breadcrumb house? Uh, breadcrumb house. Yeah. <laughs> whatever that is. <laughs> conspiracy, and, it doesn't exist. <laughs> and then you can see how um, a conspiracy theory would certainly develop. The interesting problem with that, though, is that while there will be certain people who are complete amateurs when it comes to, say, engineering in particular, when it comes to the 9-11 conspiracy, is that there are sometimes, and this is the case with both the JFK and the 9-11 ones, is that you will occasionally get someone that, at least on the surface, appears to be an expert. So maybe an actual engineer puts their hat in the ring and mm. says, I think there is something up with this. Then that becomes part of this issue of cherry picking, or are we taking one particular person's word on this and saying, ah, now we have an expert that says that this is plausible, then we can ignore all other experts. 
And that's an issue in itself. What we'll find throughout this series is this breeding of conspiracy theories on the fringes of skepticism. So the testimonial knowledge is a big one, and that's essentially what we're discussing here, is that the conspiracy theorists will say, well, we all depend on testimonial knowledge, and they'll exploit that. So the only reason I know how many people have lost their lives to the pandemic over the last 12 months is because the government give me the statistic, and I trust the experts to give me a reasonable statistic, right, with the qualifications in line, the asterisks of the kind of data they collect. But the conspiracy theorist will consult different experts, often, as Andrew's hinting to there, ones that don't have expertise in the relevant area. For example, you won't find a demolition expert, independent, impartial, saying that the buildings collapsing on September 11th collapsed in a suspicious way, right? The path of least resistance, they fall directly down and push outwards when there's not empty floors or something. But there's two tactics the conspiracy theorist is adopting here. One, they consult their own. When I was in Ukraine, I went to this museum and it was a UFO display in one of the museums. I called over one of the assistants and I said, how do they know these are UFOs? (laughs) And the lady said to me, well, they asked a UFO expert. (laughs) (laughs) I've laughed at that so much. I loved it. So a UFOologist, you might call them, that's their official uh, professional title. And I thought, well, you already knew what you were looking for when you called the UFO. <laughs> Jack was convinced, right. went to UFO University and now has four degrees in UFOlogy <laughs> for our audience. So I resent them for it. I've wasted a lot of my life to it. The <laughs> conspiracies are dangerous. <laughs> but then on the second strand, right, the uh, conspiracy theorists will question your experts. So they'll say, like during the Brexit campaign, the people of this country have had enough of experts. It's a type of going nuclear there, right? They'll say, hey, we don't want experts. We shouldn't trust them. We should be suspicious and sceptical. But then they might appeal to their own. Yeah, this is a really good time to bring in a famous quote from David Icke. So for those who don't know, David Icke is a very well-known conspiracy theorist. And he says, quote from his book, Guide to the Global Conspiracy, everything is backwards. Everything is upside down. Doctors destroy health. Judges destroy justice, universities destroy knowledge, governments destroy freedom, major media destroys information, and religions destroy spirituality. You can see through this quote exactly what Jack's saying there, this appeal to their own expertise is overriding certain specific institutions, whether that's education, government, university, hospitals, doctors, that their experts are the right experts with the real truth. What I find really fascinating about that quote is that There are tiny grains of truth to absolutely every single statement that he gives there. The question then is about being really specific about exactly how these problems. So if you say universities are responsible for teaching people a way that isn't actually the real truth, give me the evidence. And I think that's where I think a lot of conspiracy theories typically unravel. But just to go back quickly to Kassam's analysis is that what you've just said there ties into his term, he calls them self-sealing. So once you create this environment where you only believe in certain experts and certain evidence and somebody tries to counteract them, then you're given the response, well, that's what they would say. They want you to think that once you've bought into the quote mainstream is that you're now part of the conspiracy. And it's really difficult to then talk about any of these things because no matter what you say, you're going to hit that brick wall instantly of you're part of the conspiracist plan. So let's get into in just a moment the mental tricks or the philosophical mistakes or essentially from the point of view of psychology, why people believe conspiracy theories. And we'll get into that just in a moment. But I think we should emphasize just how big of a problem conspiracy theories are. Now, in the next section, next week, we'll talk about the dangers and some of the real world consequences of conspiracy theories and the harm they cause people. But we should note that they're really, really popular. And Ollie said at the start, it's not a modern phenomenon. And Joseph Yuzinski and Joseph Parent, and apparently anybody else called Joseph, in between (laughs) 1890 and 2010, found that with a big study of, I think it was a New York magazine and letters that were submitted and did a big analysis of all the things, they said conspiracy theories and discussion of them have become less popular over time. It's not the case they've been more popular than ever, although we see them all over social media and stuff, they've actually become less popular over the last 120 years or so. It is worth saying that there is this stereotype that conspiracy theorists are normally American, normally male, maybe potentially overweight or middle-aged people hiding in their mother's basements. And this is just simply not true. Conspiracy theories have always existed. They transcend class, gender, race, sexuality. They have always been there. 
And through my research, I was really surprised by that. I just assumed maybe it's just because I'm very naive that it was an internet-based thing, spreading misinformation and disinformation. But actually, the earliest conspiracy theories are in ancient Rome and ancient Greece. There's some fascinating examples that we'll refer to a little bit later of people almost ruining empires through gossip and conspiracy. Have you got an example now? That sounds really interesting. Yeah, shall we? Should we dive into the Great Fire of Rome, gentlemen? Well, just give us a little treat. Give us a little uh, breadcrumb that we can look forward to the gingerbread later. Okay, so did Emperor Nero of Rome start the Great Fire of Rome on purpose? <laughs> I mean, do you That's want to ask, answer that question? Because <laughs> I'm not sure I can. <laughs> Well, that's all the evidence I need, Ollie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, just answering that simple question. <laughs> a load of the examples we'll use today are from the USA, and just a handful of statistics that I think in the great courses, which is presented by uh, Michael Shermer, he gives a bunch of stats. It's just a handful from the USA, so you can get a good feel of how big the problem is. A third of Americans think that Obama is a foreigner, so not born on, on US soil, the birth of conspiracy. A third thing that 9-11 was an inside job. 10% believe that chemtrails, the conspiracy is true. We'll talk about that in a moment. 30% think that it's somewhat true. So that means around 100 million Americans think that the chemtrail conspiracy is likely or, or perhaps true. And 7% think the moon landings were fake. But don't think it's just a problem for the USA. In the UK, I found this astonishing, 41% of people think that the government are hiding the actual number of immigrants that come into the country. 13% think that there's a small group of people that secretly run the world. 9% of British people think that global warming is a hoax. And 2% deny the official Holocaust account. Some really scary statistics there, but it's a big number of people. It's not even just places like the UK and America. Apparently, according to a 2011 poll, four out of 10 Russians believe the USA faked the moon landing. Can't obviously see any reasons why anyone in Russia would think that, but there you go. Also, if we look at the Middle East, apparently another 2011 Pew Research Center poll shows that nearly half of people in the Middle Eastern countries doubted that the 9-11 hijackers are actually of Arab descent which is interesting. So it's not just conspiracy theorists from the USA perspective, it's also on in, from the Middle East as well. We could probably list this for hours and hours, right? Every single country, every single nationality, every single gender, their conspiracy theories are rife within society. And I think when we get into a little bit of the psychology, perhaps it's not surprising that this is quite cross-cultural and across many different demographics. But I'm sure both of you saw the Daniel Freeman and Richard P. Bentor study that Sam mentions in his book, where it says that 26.7% of the people who were questioned, and these are 26% of people who were self-identified conspiracy theorists, at least in, in some way. And it points out that there are certain demographic things that are picked out. So the study stated that the people who were conspiracy theorists were more likely to be male, unmarried, less educated, have lower household incomes, see themselves as a lower social standing and lower levels of physical or mental health. So I don't know whether or not that contradicts the previous data or if it's just one particular study. So I'd be interested to hear what you think about that. Well, from my reading of everything, to start off with Ollie's point, yes, it is widespread regardless of demographic. So 42% of people with high school diplomas will believe in a conspiracy. Only 22% of postgraduates believe in a conspiracy theory, but 22% of postgraduates, that's not a big dip from people without high school diplomas to postgraduates, a 20% drop. So it does seem widespread there. It seems that the type of conspiracy can be determined by the group. So if you're from a black or brown community, you're more likely to think that the CIA planted cocaine to ruin your neighborhood or that they released AIDS, i.e. the government did, to reduce the population of people who are racialized as black or brown. So those have an impact. But on your point, Andy, what I found was that people who have lost their job recently, people who have been a victim of a natural disaster, people who think that the world's going to end fairly soon, those who are paranoid or insecure about their stability are way more likely to believe in a conspiracy theory. So that tells us a little bit something, and we're definitely verging on the psychology here, right? That we start to think there's explanations that perhaps aren't there when we're the victim of misfortune. Even with giving all of those demographics that I did, there could be a combination of factors that means that somebody ends up in this position. So it might be that, say, unmarried men are more likely to end up in lower income situations or something like that. So the fact that they're male or unmarried might have very little impact on why they believe in a conspiracy in the first place. We're being quite broad here, aren't we, about capital C conspiracy theories. So 
a university academic who believes that potentially there may be some nefarious goings on in some form of government administration isn't exactly the same as David Icke saying the world's being run by lizard people. So surely there's degrees here. I'm not saying that, you know, if you're from a working class background, if you've recently lost your job, you're going to blame it on the lizard people. But I think that there's <laughs> degrees here, right? We know that it's within society, it affects you know, even well-educated people. And some people might say one factor of being an educated person is, is questioning, right? Like being skeptical of knowledge that's given to you, analyzing it and potentially not agreeing with the initial figures. I mean, I know lots of people that disagree with the government figures on COVID, for example, people that I respect in terms of their opinions and views. Now, is that a, quote, conspiracy theory in the same way that the lizard people are? Not really. I, I wouldn't say so. And we see this in our everyday lives, right? You might be sat there thinking, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. But then imagine a co-worker is, say, mean to you at work or does something you don't like. And you think, oh, they've got it out for me. And then you start analyzing all their little behaviors. Oh, they're only doing that to plot against me. or They've given me that extra work because they're trying to overload me with work. And perhaps you don't have enough reason to back up that. And you've made a big inductive leap on the basis of a few small examples. You've went from breadcrumbs to gingerbread house in a flash. <laughs> so maybe you don't think that your co-worker is a lizard person, but perhaps you're saying they are conspiring against you for some negative end without proper justification. So I think it's probably about time we could get into why people believe in conspiracy theories then. And before going about the research, and this is something I didn't find in any of the books that I read, I'm not saying I know something that all these experts are conspiracy theorists do. You, but are you questioning experts, Jack? Is that <laughs> yeah. what you're doing? <laughs> this amateur knows better than it. <laughs> and it's got to be somewhere, right, in some of the papers or something. But I thought when I went into it, like, because you have a lot of people with kooky views in philosophy, a lot of people write into the show and say to us, hey, can you do something that I can talk to my friends about to sound smart? Or could you do something that I can talk about in conversations at, at dinner so people think I've got interesting views? Don't talk about abstract stuff. I'm thinking, you're missing the point, right? That's not the point of the podcast. The podcast is bad philosophy, not interesting things to bring up at the dinner table. Wait, I thought philosophy was just about making people think you're smart, right? <laughs> Isn't that the whole point? And we've been doing a so, really terrible job of that for the last five <laughs> years. <laughs> I don't think we're in danger of anyone thinking we're smart. <laughs> I thought, well, maybe a lot of people believe in conspiracy theories, so it's good for their social standing. They've got interesting things to say. They can debate and discuss and show people they know something that other people don't. They question stuff. And maybe there's a bit of egotism wrapped into why some people will adopt a, a conspiracy theory. A bit of pop psychology, maybe. Yeah, I agree 100%. One thing I felt that was lacking from some of the research I read, which was like, I can imagine it's quite a lot of fun believing in conspiracy theories. And I don't mean that cynically, I would genuinely like, mm. if you read some of these, the stuff out online about certain conspiracy theories, you kind of almost get to like play detective and it's really yeah. exciting and it's really fun. I'm a teacher and I do a detective lesson with my year eights on the resurrection of Jesus, right? So if he didn't come <laughs> back to life, what happened to the body? The first thing I was thinking there is just like the biggest conspiracy on earth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll get onto that later. But yeah, so like what happened to the body? And honestly, and it's same with kids as adults, right? It's fun. It's fun to like give in some evidence and try and figure out what happens. We've already highlighted that towards the beginning of the episode. We talked about the contrariness of it is that there is something fun about feeling like you're in the know, or if it's mm. not fun, it's just it makes that sense of importance and that you're discovering something that is hidden under the surface. And that's incredibly appealing, as Ollie's just mm -hmm. said there. It strikes me as no surprise in the slightest that once you get into these things, you get hooked. And one of the things we haven't mentioned yet is that people who believe in certain types of conspiracies are more likely to then buy into others. So it's kind of almost a snowball effect there once you've bought into certain key tenets of conspiracy theories. Is that suddenly now, as you quoted from David Icke, is now, now everything is not a coincidence. Everything is connected and you just have to put the pieces together. I think that's definitely right. And we can unpack that in a moment. I wanted to pick up on something Ollie said very briefly. Yeah, I think people love the conspiracy theories because they're interesting. We love storytelling, right? So it's not the case that people sit down there and break down their thoughts into premises and a conclusion and think of objections and you know, make sure the logical operators are all there at on point. We like storytelling. We like a narrative. So most people see their lives as a narrative. We see political stories or people's individual stories or fights and wars and ways to change the world. We see them in narrative form. So when you've got a really cool story, it's like a fiction, fancy, mysterious whodunit book. But in real life, that's got some real appeal. 
definitely the book that I read in detail for this podcast episode was Rob Rutherton's Suspicious Minds. And in that, he talks about how story is a really underestimated part of conspiracy theories, how actually stories often bypass our critical faculties. You know, unlike mm. a philosophical argument, like Jack said, with like a premise and a conclusion, they almost trump philosophy, right? They don't use it. They use story instead. And that those narratives are really strong. He references a really specific book called The Seven Basic Plots by Christopher Booker. And one of those plots is the overcoming the monster, right? And this is a really common story in lots of different cultures. So you have a peaceful village or situation and then the monster appears. Goodness gracious me, and the monster causes <laughs> havoc within that village or community. The hero appears to fight the monster, but the monster's too powerful. But just at the right moment, the hero finds the weakness of the monster and defeats the monster and peace is restored to the village. Now, this is almost a narrative which you could apply to nearly all of these conspiracy theories. The idea that there is an evil authority that is terrifying or terrorizing the people and that it needs to be overthrown and discovered through the truth. I think that that analysis is quite apt. I think that lots of people, if you look at 9-11, JFK, loads of conspiracy theories, there's this narrative, good versus evil, people versus the monster, David versus Goliath, the underdog versus the authority that really appeals to a lot of people and empowers them to be like, actually, no, I'm, I'm on the underdog side, I'm on the good side, fighting the evil monster. And this evil monster is usually behind the scenes and Wizard of Oz, no one ever really sees the man behind the curtain. And that allows them to have lots of explanatory power, which they wouldn't have if the person was out in the open or not revealing their secrets, right? It's a part of the fabric of the conspiracy theory. But one reason why, from an evolutionary point of view, and I think we spoke to Robert Wright about this, is something that Michael Shermer speaks about in his great courses. Imagine we're out on the African plains and I hear a, a rustle, like in the bushes or near the trees, and I think, ah, like danger, predator, right? I don't think, or I see some, like a, a hose in the field as I'm walking to wherever I might be going, the gingerbread house, and I think, ah, snake, right? And it's better for me to think that. And why? Because maybe one in a thousand times, it is actually a snake rather than a hose. So if I walk through that field a thousand times, if I don't think it's a snake, then one of them I'm going to get caught out. So we're evolutionary programmed to think worst case scenario, plan for the worst. So when something bad happens, we're going to think predator, negative force to guard against that thing. And that hyper sensitivity towards agency is, a, is one of the leading causes. All that kind of evolutionary biology and psychology stuff, you can see lots of crossover with beliefs about spirituality and mm. even beliefs in God. And that really human tendency to sense that there is true essences to things. And young children do this all the time when it comes to cartoons. You can get shapes that are quite nondescript. You don't even have to put a face on the shape. And you can have two shapes following one another. And young children will associate that and think that these two shapes are playing with one another or maybe attacking one another. And same thing goes oh, wow. with agency as well. So it's really deep within us that we want to project agency and essences onto everything. Now, of course, on a closer analysis, we can then notice that a lot of the times when we think there might be agency or there might be connections with things is that they're simply not there. But as you've already said, our minds jump to that conclusion quite quickly. And that seems to be inherent in most people. Yeah, I really want to develop what Andy said there, because I think this is fascinating. So the psychologist Evelyn Rizet talks about hyperactive intentionality bias, which is pretty much what Andy just explained, that when we're children, we assume that the world has intention behind everything. And she argues that actually when we are tired, or if we're maybe just lose, lost our job or stressed or even drunk or under the influence of drugs, that we revert back to this. We assume that the world around us has intention in things which don't have intention. And actually, I think this is a really nice link, which is to Daniel Kenneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, which was published in 2012 which is a bit of a slog if you are going to read it, but it does have some really interesting <laughs> parts in it. Fast. It is a good book. I enjoyed that book. I don't know <laughs> what the haters I've got nothing there. against you, Daniel. Um, I'm sure you're listening. And in that book, he talks about the idea that when we are thinking, our brain often makes shortcuts between our thoughts. So sometimes our intuitions to keep ourselves sane on a normal day, instead of hyper-analyzing every little thing we see, our brain creates shortcuts to make it more efficient. And so we can think, wonder about what we're going to be doing at work while we're traveling to work or etc. Right. And you can definitely see this affecting conspiracy theories, right? This idea of almost intention detection, we could call it. Again, the idea that there might be some intention behind a, a force like, quote, a government and thinking of the mm. evil government, not thinking of it as like 
hundreds of thousands of people working in separate buildings or even communicating via things like email or phone calls. So even if we take, I don't know, like the 9-11 truth is a good example of this, right? Is it more plausible that it was 12 hijackers that had the intention to destroy the World Trade Center or hundreds of thousands of anonymous people that you can just call, quote, the government and kind of blame them as if the government would have some kind of intention, when in reality, it might have just been incompetence on the government's part because it is so hard to communicate within that system. You can definitely see that in that intention detection within children, within ourselves, and our brain often can kind of make these very big, like Jack said earlier, logical leaps. We're not really thinking slow, we're thinking too fast. Yeah, another term for that, you may have come across the fundamental attribution error, which is the tendency to blame other people's behavior on internal rather than situational factors. And that's another just quite classic thing that we're all guilty of doing, where we explain our own behaviors on all these effects and reasons for why, in fact, we've made a mistake. But if somebody else makes a mistake, we want to say, ah, well, that's their fault and their intention. And that if they harmed me, it was completely on purpose. And so you could see how that would then translate to, well, something's gone wrong here. Let's blame either the leader or the government and say that that was always intended, intricately planned. But as you've already pointed out, is actually often, particularly with big organizations or institutions, is that the scope for error there is huge. And actually, bureaucracy often just gets in the way of this really clever planning that people think that's going on. Now, that again, does not mean that sometimes governments do not conspire. It absolutely does happen. But perhaps not as much as we might want to think. There's loads of great things there. And I thought the agenticity one was certainly a big one, right? And Daniel Dennett spoke to us about this when he thinks about the foundations of religion. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned religion itself there, Andy. And I was thinking, just for the purpose of listeners, what I thought was interesting was a distinction drawn by Richard Swinburne. I think a lot of these books draw as well, and I'm sure it's prominent. It definitely is prominent before he discusses it. There's two kinds of causal explanations, right? Scientific ones and personal ones. Scientific explanations explain things in terms of past events, states, and natural laws, whereas personal explanations explain things as brought about by agents. And then we've got this patternicity as well, the idea that we see patterns when they aren't quite there. And so it's much simpler to adopt a sort of teleological explanation in which you have an agent that just does something, right? that just explains why this event has occurred, than it is to accept the randomness and chaos of how the actual physical system plays out. So you mentioned Daniel Kahneman's book earlier, Ollie, and one thing I really want to pull out is the message of that book is that we're not very good at understanding probability. And this seems like the biggest cause for me in terms of how does the underlying philosophical structure of conspiracy theories work. It's not the case that all of us great scientists or really clear deductive inductive thinkers, and a lot of the time we're doing a sort of garden variety of philosophy. A bird poops on your car, right? You don't sit there with a clipboard and work out what all the causes and reasons are. You just move your car away from the tree, let's say. And so you associate certain causes with certain effects and you fail to realize when something reaches a probability of 50% or more for it to be probably true, right? And so we're not very good at spotting when things are probably true. Let me stop speaking abstractly and I'll use an example from Kahneman's book. So Ollie's 31 years old. He's happily married, he's outspoken, he's very bright, he majored in philosophy, and as a student he was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice, and also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. Participants are asked, which is more probable? One, that Ollie is a philosopher, or two, that Ollie is a philosopher and a cool dude? Now, 85% of people (laughs) would pick option two, and in this case they'd be right to do so. Damn right. However, The probability of the two events occurring together in conjunction is always less than one of them simply coming true. Known as the conjunctive fallacy, one event on its own is always going to be more likely than two events occurring simultaneously. Yet 85% of people don't see this basic mistake in probability thinking and go for the second option. So that's just a small example of how we're not very good in everyday scenarios with these basic questions of determining how likely something is to be the case. While we're still on the topic of psychological explanations, I don't think we've actually mentioned proportionality bias yet, Mm. but this is a really, really classic one when it comes to conspiracy theories, because it's the bias that states that we're inclined to think that if some big event happens, particularly if it's surrounding somebody who is really important, that we 
must assume that the reason for why this thing happened must also be big itself. So we're not content with the idea that Princess Diana just died in a tragic accident, that because she was so famous, that some really important reason must have caused this thing to happen. And same thing with 9-11, same thing with JFK and all the other ones we've really mentioned when it comes to something to do with leaders in particular. And you can see how that would be so appealing and why that's so prevalent. Going back to that sense of essence is we want to say that certain things happen for reasons, even if it's not apparent that they do. Yeah, I found the proportionality bias one of the most interesting factors that I hadn't really thought about before. So this idea that a big, almost world-changing event The idea that it's caused by something so small or improbable or even just not important is quite scary. So let's take COVID as an example, right? So lots of people hypothesize that the COVID-19 virus was made in a lab in China and it escaped the lab and obviously spread from there as some kind of bioweapon. That made for a lot of people appear more comforting that it was genetically designed to infect the world than currently the official explanation is it just mutated like many viruses do. And it was just a very nasty strain that did mutate really quickly and really badly. And because of air travel, you know, spread around the world really quickly. That's much less satisfying. And even intellectually, right, it's much less satisfying than actually this disease was designed to harm. I've got a really good quote here from Jan William Van Prusen and Eric Van Dijk. Sorry if I completely ruined your names there, guys. On the proportionality bias, where they say, the proportionality bias can affect the way we explain events in our lives. We often write off little things as happenstance. But when something big and life-changing happens, we assume it must have a big cause. Big events happen halfway across the world, and they may have very little direct impact on us. Yet, if we imagine ourselves as the victims of this event, it almost forces us to imagine ourselves in the place of the victims, and then assume it must be a big thing. It couldn't have just been one guy and three bullets that assassinated JFK. That was like a life-changing event for America. It must be something bigger to it. And I find that just really fascinating. And even in my own thinking, actually, yeah, when I think of big events in my life, in memories, they've always got this big build up and it's all very dramatic. And, you know, the first time I met you two was probably just quite boring, really. But now in my head, it's like (laughs) the meeting of three minds, the start of a philosophical (laughs) empire. You know, it's we do it all the time. And I think that was a really that the portionality bias, I think, is really interesting in that way. I think you're suffering from another psychological problem (laughs) called delusions of grandeur. Um, But yeah, but we almost can't help it. right? It's almost in our nature. Perhaps in analysis, we'll get more into this kind of thing. But particularly going back to the COVID situation, it's really interesting how that also teaches us, and myself included, of how important just having background knowledge on a particular thing is before you can jump to conclusions about how likely or unlikely it is. Because if you look at actual scientists and data, is that I think there was an expectation that we were kind of due a pandemic in certain ways and that we were very fortunate that we've been able to stop the spread of viruses happening and that one was bound to fall through the gaps. And once you know that, then suddenly things like COVID seem completely believable that it just happened. I think this ties into one of the other leading causes or psychological features of conspiracy theories that is kind of buzzword going around at the moment or at least a popular idea of cognitive dissonance. So this is the type of mental discomfort that we have when we think we have the right position on something, a contrary fact comes along and we have to deal with it. So I might think, for example, that Princess Diana is a really special person and something unspecial or mundane or absurd happens to her. And so I need to do some uh, mental gymnastics or reduce or remove the discomfort that I'm feeling because of this tension. And so with the COVID-19 thing, I'm exposed to lots of information about the atrocities committed by the Chinese government in terms of people's privacy and people's literal physical health, people's below the poverty line on on a daily basis. And then when an accident comes out, like it's contrary to my view of China and it's with all the rhetoric going on. So then I reduce or remove the discomfort by collapsing the two things together. Yeah, and Jack, this really connects to confirmation bias, doesn't it, as well, right? So when we are presented with information that we are inclined to agree with anyway, we tend to remember it more, we tend to prioritize it in our mind, and then therefore that becomes what we think happened. I guess the most obvious way you can see this is through politics, right? There's events that happen within politics where someone may say something in a certain situation, and if we agree with that statement, we will be like, oh, no, that person was right. They said the right thing at the right time. When actually, if it's something we disagree with, it's like, oh, no, how could they possibly say that? That's completely tone deaf, completely inappropriate. When in fact, there could be multiple 
factors inclined on what that person did or didn't say. And you can definitely see division there and people being surrounded by people that agree with them, and especially on things like social media, this really becomes a, a problem where you're just surrounded by people that all agree on the same process. And then again, you get confirmed of your own opinion already. So you don't even have to do any thinking. I remember talking to a friend of mine once about a book that I lent them to read and they were like, oh, it was brilliant. You know what was brilliant about it? It just completely reaffirmed what I thought already. And I remember <laughs> thinking, okay, that doesn't sound great. Like surely you should have been like, oh, I agreed with some of the examples. We like it, don't we? When our views get confirmed or supported by looking into the world and picking apart different pieces of information. Yeah, it's like reading Schopenhauer and coming out think he's a, thinking he's a panpsychist or something. <laughs> but, uh, there's a nice quote from Francis Bacon that I think captures it. The general root of superstition is that men observe when things hit and not when they miss and commit to memory the one and forget and pass over the other. And I think Jeffrey Cohen in a research project found that when the same bill is proposed by a Democrat or a Republican, if it's proposed by a Democrat, they'll accept it if they're a Democrat. It could be the same bill, but it's proposed by a Republican, then they won't accept it because they want to discount the hits of the Republicans and only their misses. Let us pause for a moment to say a quick thank you to all of our string-pulling patrons for connecting the dots over at patreon.com forward slash pansycast. In particular, a very special thank you to the cold-blooded reptile ruling the world, that's Mr. Adam Cool. He denies the claim that the A-Team killed JFK. It's Mr. T. He's not a member of the Illuminati. He's a very naughty boy. It's the life of Brian. Ramirez. She's been abducted by UFOs and can guarantee their ships are indeed flying saucers. It's Miss Lily. Hooper. The patron saint of pattern recognition. It's St. David Ligeness. Gasping for air that the moon landing may have been fake. It's Jamie Lung. The 9-11 truther who won't stop until he's worn out his tires. It's Jay Wheelless. And finally, the man whose name must be an alias. It's Moron van der Kolk. If you're enjoying the show, then please head over to patreon.com forward slash pansycast to show your support. A link is also in the iTunes description. Right, let's jump back into it. And we're touching upon a couple of really important things here of the complexities of different psychological phenomena that explain things. But also when we bring these all together under particular worldviews and ideologies as well, which is something I want to come back to in a second. But I just wanted to touch upon the things that Ollie was saying about once you have a particular sort of partisan type of view, because I have personally found myself after reading about things is I remember reading a study that suggested that if you read an article that is contrary to what you already know or think, that you actually mm. find it more challenging to read and that you're more likely to stop reading it halfway through and get distracted and do something else. And I don't know if then that became sort of a thing that I thought and felt was happening just because I'd read about it. But I do sometimes wonder, yeah, how much am I rejecting because of that? And I, I've definitely had articles where I think I don't agree with this and I have slogged through. And it is more challenging. And that mm. means that we're actually all in this really strong fight against the tide to make sure that we're doing our part to gain what is at least hopefully a closer image of the truth. But even people who claim to care about the truth, like us philosophers, are actually <laughs> really bad at that too. Yeah, I think that's what's fascinating about conspiracy theories is hopefully all the things we're discussing, we find that they're problems in our own thinking, but they're taken to the extremes in a lot of cases with the thoughts of conspiracy theories. So we're all susceptible to it. We can all get sucked into one of these, what law calls intellectual black holes. Now, well, something that you've just mentioned, Andrew, I think it's a study by Sam Harris and some of his colleagues who scanned people's brains as they engaged with certain ideas. And when they were reading them the first hand, they just accepted them as prima facie obvious truths, right? Beliefs come quickly and naturally. Skepticism is slow and unnatural. So when you're being skeptical, you feel discomforted. Parts of your brain are activated, which are associated with disgust and negative feelings. So it's not just the case that it's really difficult to be skeptical and we need to learn the tools and know how to be critical thinkers, but also it's not a nice process. And you probably find this really obvious when you have a critical discussion with someone. It's really upsetting when you have to have one with somebody. It's much easier to agree with them and you might have that same problem in your own mind. So this is perhaps best captured by Spinoza's view, because it's Spinoza's conjecture. We take beliefs as natural and true as if they were observations about the world and it's only after the fact that we determine their truth value and that's much more difficult to do. 
And in light of what you've just been saying there is that we have that problem of entrenching and actually strengthening our convictions after we've been forced to combat them. And that creates, and we'll look at this when we're talking about how to actually look at conspiracy theories critically, is if you want to engage someone and convince them out of a belief, it's so much harder than simply just saying, let's just lay out the logic and lay out the facts, because that's not all that's important to people. And it's certainly not how people typically come to their worldviews and their beliefs. So, so far, we've talked about lots of different psychological dispositions. We've mentioned, our dear listeners are loving this, by the way. They're like, right, I know exactly why my crazy (laughs) uncle believes in lizard people. It's because he's got (laughs) cognitive bias, all the different theories we've mentioned. Now, I can just tell him about all these psychological theories, and he's just going to stop believing in lizard people, right? It's as simple and clear cut as that. What we quite like about Kassam's book, especially, is he has a really interesting insight, doesn't he, Andy, about the political implications of these conspiracy theories. It's not just some people believe in lizard people. It's a bit more complex than that. So his analysis is that conspiracy theories in the way that we've been describing them are actually first and foremost types of political propaganda before anything else. And you might be thinking at this point, how does one arrive at that conclusion? Because it seems as if after all of the things we've been talking about, There's like a certain type of psychological disposition that means that people will believe these things. And when they share them, they must believe that they're true. That's why they do it. There is no political agenda to this at all. So how on earth could, and just to be clear, he he can't say that every single type of Mm. conspiracy theory is political propaganda, but he does think that an awful lot of the popular ones are. And final point on the psychological phenomena is that He does say that one of the reasons why we should be skeptical about putting it all down to psychology is simply because of some of the reasons we've already talked about, which is that we're all prone to certain biases. So why isn't it that vast majorities of people aren't conspiracy theories with the capital C and the capital T? Because if we're all susceptible, we would expect more people to be conspiracy theorists, but not everybody has this conspiracy mindset. So he says that it is more of an ideology than a personality trait, and that This is because it links into our political views. Now, this is where perhaps it gets contentious because I've read certain different things on this because I think certain clearly, and we talked about the demographics earlier, that you can be both left-wing and right-wing and you can have your own left-wing and right-wing conspiracies. And in that sense, particularly the ones that are political, clearly they have a political agenda. But Kassam suggests that an awful lot of conspiracy theories, perhaps in the modern world, typically are right-leaning or if not leaning, completely are just right-wing ideological platforms. How and why this happens? Well, if we have a little look, he gives the example of the Sandy Hook elementary school shooting, which happened back in 2012, uh, the killer Adam Lanza. So people like Alex Jones of Infowars and others propagated a conspiracy, which was that this was actually a false flag operation, that the shooting never happened. First of all, who did it? Well, the government. Why would the government fake a shooting at a school and share this story around? Because they secretly wanted to put in more gun control regulations. And so Kassam looks at that and says, what would be the political motivation for coming up with this particular conspiracy? And his result is that it is the opposite of what the conspiracy theorists are saying. So the reason why Alex Jones pushes this is that it's actually political propaganda to make sure that the Second Amendment rights are upheld. So that what we're trying to achieve here is to actually get people stop talking about gun control and start talking about the fact that it's all a government cover-up. Now, ironically, according to the data, is that after mass shootings happen in, in America, is that gun sales go up. So people like Alex Jones should be less worried, it seems, about gun control regulation being passed because it certainly isn't happening. And sadly, very recently, there has been another shooting that's happened in America. And so those discussions will continue to happen. And I'm sure types of conspiracies will continue to surround this problem. And just to be clear again, why do they keep happening? Well, according to Kassam, they are political in nature. There's loads of great stuff in there. I just wanted to pick up on a few. And I think we've mentioned this before, that people who believe in conspiracy theories typically believe or can believe or often believe in contradictory theories. The quote from a a study here, the more participants believe that Princess Diana faked her own death, the more they believed she was murdered. And I think that's from Michael Wood and Karen Douglas, Robbie Sutton and so on, dead or alive. And there's lots of other examples 
which are in the literature of things we've already mentioned. People who are more likely to be hypersensitive to agenticity, people who are more likely to find patterns in things. And I think Kassan would likely agree with this analysis, and you pose the question, Andy, this is, is where it gets contentious, right? Because it's obvious that some people are more disposed psychologically to adopt conspiracy theories rather than ideology. Kassan writes in his book, the answer to the question of why people believe conspiracy theories is, it's complicated. I think that's the best answer, right? There's a plethora of reasons why people might believe in them, but very often it can be political. But when we think of the different types of conspiracy theories, you know, when we've got UFOs, anti-Semitism, Pearl Harbor, medical ones, suspicious deaths, like the belief that Avril Lavigne died and was replaced <laughs> by some other person because she was scared of the public light, or that... Isn't the one with Paul McCartney? Yeah, Paul, Paul McCartney, McCartney died. died in 1967, has been played by an actor ever since. I think for some reason, right. I can't remember why. There are clear examples when people are just making psychological or philosophical mistakes, right? I'm sure you'd agree. Yeah, I, I think that should be exactly the takeaway there. One final point on this, just to unpack, just in case his analysis isn't particularly convincing for some, is I'll give a couple of his other arguments that he uses to bolster it. So he says that propaganda does not have to be knowingly false. So some people might say, surely these people are sharing something they know to be false, so it's not propaganda. But actually, mm. that's not necessarily how propaganda works at all. The Nazis propagated things that they held to be completely true, and it was still propaganda. And equally, propaganda can still be propaganda regardless of intention as well. So whether or not you think that you're sharing political propaganda has nothing to do about it being political propaganda or not. I thought that, yeah, that's quite interesting because it means that there are some people, and he even mentions this in the book, is that, wait a minute, this sounds like a conspiracy theory about conspiracy theories. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, why not? I'm allowed to do this. And so, yeah, there is this sense that there are people out there who are unknowingly giving out political propaganda for views that they may not even necessarily hold. And that this is all part of the way that these things typically work. There was many favorite facts that I did during my research. My favorite one was that there was a conspiracy theory in the 1960s about the word conspiracy theory. So when the word conspiracy <laughs> theory was introduced, apparently there was a group of people who were like, no, 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 no. You're just trying to mislabel our opinions by calling it a conspiracy theory, which I thought was brilliant. hilarious and brilliant. I think it's worth saying, like Andy said, that Kassam's argument is based on this idea of propaganda. That's not the only view presented about conspiracy theory. So Rob Brotherton in his book argues that it's more of a psychological disposition and he says that it does affect people not just on right wing but also in left wing too. It's not just something that's unique to right wing politics in America even though that is something that very much gets lots of headlines and is, I mean, let's be honest, guys, like Infowars and Alec Jones's show is pantomime, like it is entertaining, it's funny. And I think that don't fall into the trap, dear audience, of thinking that, no, we're just saying it's just conspiracy theories are right-wing political propaganda. Kassam would potentially argue so, but not every single person would agree. And I think his reasoning for that is presumably his point on the fact that it is something ideological happening and that ideologies cannot be explained entirely in the types of psychological analysis that we were given and that they're a broader thing there. And so people's convictions on in political differences are like an underlying thing which then leads them into types of conspiracies. And hence why, as we've already pointed out, is that left-wing people will fall for certain types of conspiracies, but it's because their worldview is already shaped in a way that leads them to that. So in a way then, is that you could try and combat the types of cognitive biases, for instance, and see if you could solve the problem through that. That might be a difficult thing to do. Or you could approach somebody's political ideology and ask questions about the underlying assumptions of people's values, and that might be another approach. Now, just to be clear here, Kassam, and I assume others, do not think that this is an easy thing to do. To be able to approach someone's worldview and ideology of how they view the world, and actually get them to seriously consider dropping that. I guess with some people it would be impossible. As we'll talk about in next week's instalment, there are certainly people who are on the fringes or in the centre who are certainly worth bringing over with yes. rational argument and, and pointing out the facts and logical inconsistencies. And studies have shown that people will change their minds in the light of those things. I think a couple of things worth mentioning as we finish up is we've mentioned a few conspiracy entrepreneurs like Alex Jones makes a lot of money from it and so will perpetuate these conspiracies. It is pantomime. Uh, there's a lot of political capital and financial gain there. So Trump was a leading advocate of the Obama Bertha conspiracy. Antifa were undercover rioters taking over the Capitol. And this FBI disproved this. And 
just so happens that Fox News airs something completely different on the time when he's giving his testimony and barely mention it. Again, that cognitive bias, picking the facts, counting your not even hits, just like made up <laughs> hits and ignoring the misses. But one of the big things I find I saw a fair few people who do believe in conspiracy theories, people that think COVID-19 is a ploy for the government to make sure they can tax everybody's income, to stop using cash, to start using cards, so they can see how much money's going in your account. And there are people that think that the ambulances which would go around during the pandemic are empty and used to make people think that people are going to hospital and dying. That's quite on the radical side, right? I know loads of people who believe in basic conspiracies too, and so they are widespread. But one of the things they often point to is that they do happen. Or don't think this doesn't happen. Here's an example. And you find this constantly in these documentaries that you see. Take one example which we're all aware of. The US Public Health Service, the syphilis conspiracy, more than 40 years ago it ended. So like 600 people were part, 399 black members of the American society had syphilis. And they didn't give them the cure, right? They allowed them to carry on having syphilis. When it ended, only 74 of them were still alive. 40 of their wives contracted it. 19 of their children contracted it. Julius Caesar, Guy Fawkes, Franz Ferdinand, like the Iraq War, we know the conspiracies happen. So I think this might be from Kassam's book. The more you learn about proven conspiracies in your part of the world, the more you will be inclined to believe unproven conspiracy theories. I think we'll talk about this in the next section, right? There is clearly a difference. I don't even have to say this. It's obvious. From the existential quantifier of some conspiracies happen to the universal that they always happen, the proof of one doesn't necessarily prove. It's very, very limited evidence for more of them. But in a lot of these cases, there's not just an absence of evidence, but an evidence of absence. There's hundreds of thousands of documents leaked by WikiLeaks, right, by Julian Assange and his people, or by Edward Snowden whistleblowing. And, and there's no evidence in there at all of, I mean, there's evidence of Iraq war crimes, of torturing civilians, like crucifying people by electricity. But in all of the hundreds of thousands of documents leaked by the government, there's nothing about a 9-11 cover-up. There's nothing about UFOs. There's nothing about JFK. Like, it's not there. And that should point you heavily towards the idea that that's evidence against the view. It's not just impartial. That's a hit on the side of the anti-conspirator. Yeah, is it Christopher Hitchens when he talks about God? He says that, you know, if you believe in God, you have the burden of proof. You're going to need some pretty good evidence for that. And I think we can take the same approach with conspiracy theories, right? Yes, if there is evidence, you know, follow where the evidence goes. But surely an absence or a lack of evidence would point you in the direction that maybe you're barking up the wrong tree. And I really like, you know, if you're sat around the dinner table trying to think of a good quote you can share with your family to sound clever, I really like the one from Catherine Olmsted where she just says, conspiracy theories are easy ways of telling complicated stories. That actually maybe the truth is much less dramatic, much less entertaining, and much more boring potentially, or less fulfilling than it may seem or that you may want it to be. And I think that's quite a nice way to sum up conspiracy theories. Something that isn't mundane or boring is Mystery Philosopher. The Mystery Philosopher. We might not know who shot JFK and poisoned Descartes, but see if you can guess who this is. No one is safe. Do you understand that? Pure evil is running wild everywhere at the highest levels. I mean, that's Alex Jones, isn't it? <laughs> that's Alex Jones. <laughs> well done, Andrew. Think, you know you're Alex Jones pretty well. Uh, only because we watched that clip before the, uh, before the <laughs> we've, recording. Yeah, we've completely downplayed Alex Jones. Alex Jones is hilarious. Like, if you want a bit of a giggle, then just watch some of Alex Jones running around in the dark, shouting at people in the street <laughs> about info that's wars. That's a great clip. When the funny. guy flips him the bird yeah. and he chases him down the street. Some, <laughs> some Alex Jones is commentating. Some guy just comes up to him, puts his middle finger up to him <laughs> and shout runs after him we'll put a link to that in the on the website as well as a link to his supplements <laughs> yeah. and there's the Andrew Neil interview that we all watched beforehand which is one of the funniest is it the Andrew Neil yeah, is that Andrew the one where Alex Jones is on BBC we'll put a link to that as well which is uh, one of the funniest clips out there too to go to our website for that but otherwise uh, you can go to patreon.com forward slash pansycast to get next week's instalment until then we'll see you on the other side. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sai Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. 
Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the PanSciCast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash PanSciCast. The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That's that was that great. Was that was really good. Great. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Great. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're yeah. doing a wonderful thing with this. <laughs>